Okay, so basically what we're beginning now is our full color palette painting. Um, and we're going to be kind of reiterating some of the lessons that we've talked about in our previous paintings as far as like really establishing our volume using light and shadow correctly. That is primary and that's at the top of our list right after doing a good foundation drawing and good composition. Next after that comes value and color is down the list further. So remember that you should never give up color in reference to trying to hold on to color and yet losing your value. So we're going to be trying to control that sense of volume and color and light and shadow. We're going to use our primary colors in um, warm and cool and the reason we're going to do that is to try and keep you from just getting color out of a tube and trying to match colors and pick out colors according to like pigments rather trying to still mix things that you want and learning how to mix them correctly the more familiar you are with the palette the easier it makes your job on the painting itself so our primary colors of red yellow and blue you'll get a warm and a cool of each of those we're also going to look at the comp composition of light and shadow, which leads us to the idea of Baroque lighting and depth. And we're going to kind of use that to create a sense of focus within our compositions. And then laying in our background to establish the shadow mass is going to be something that we're going to do directly this time. Our previous two paintings, what we did is we established our shadow mass by default by wiping out our lights. But on this painting, we're actually going to establish the shadow mass ourselves. These are some examples of student paintings. This is from a folder of images that basically those same photographs you guys will be able to use as well. And then I switched a couple of years ago to doing all still lives for this project because there's so much value to learning how to do the still life from real objects. Um, but obviously with working online, we're not going to be able to do that quite so easily, at least not this semester. So these are some examples from the still life. And you notice how the painting, even though it's in full color, it still feels like everything pulls together. The color doesn't feel separate from other things. And that's kind of the virtue of working with like a limited palette, which is essentially what we're still doing by just using the primaries and mixing. We're using a limited palette and we're using those mixtures of color and establishing a shadow mass and a light mass and um, and it brings a continuity like we don't have four different greens we have basically one or two greens that we can slightly adjust one way or the other to make them more what we want but there's a little bit more clarity to our color and it all pulls together a little better and it becomes unified by value of using the same colors in other places. And this is a great example of that because you can see the violets that are used here tie very nicely to the violets that are used within these grapes as well as the violets that are used within this transparent glass bottle. Um, another thing that's nice about this image is you can see how the shadows have a lot of resolution and color to them, um, but they're definitely different from the light sides, and the light sides are very separate from the shadows. Um, you can see that this violet was brought throughout even within like accents within the leaves and the shadows in here. So it's one of the things I really would like you guys to focus on is how to pull your painting together as a whole. This is a wonderful example right here. It was from the same still lives that you're seeing back here. Um, but the still life, instead of painting all the red drapery that was in the background, that was the red drapery that you see down here, they blacked it all out to create a sense of focus within the painting and to let this become the primary element of the painting. And you can really see how it focuses most obviously on these elements and then secondarily on some of these elements here. So there's a real richness to it and it really allows you to direct the viewer to what you want them to look at. This is another one that used the idea of the Baroque painters of um, simplifying out the backgrounds and creating a sense of focus in the immediate objects. Um, this one did it not quite so obviously but it did do it. You can see that there's a richer light happening within these areas and then within this counterbalance area right here and then in this area all this red drapery in the background um, this artist lowered the contrast level down quite a lot and also took away some of the saturation of the red so that these stood out more. I think if I were going to say anything, I'd say maybe like increasing some of the light right through here might have been a nice touch to help connect these just a little bit more. Um, another one here, this one and this one are from the exact same still life. You can see just kind of the differences and like the tones that one artist used for the background 
or used for the drapery going behind the bottle here. Um, the rich like contrast between the shadow sides and the light sides of objects. Um, and then you can look at this one here, really nicely done, not quite as strong a contrast in here. Different tones used in here, nothing wrong, just different treatments of the same subject matter. And some people might prefer one way and some might prefer the other. This is one that was done from the photographs, and I think that's one of the things that's kind of nice for the people that are taking this class this semester. You're going to be back on the photos, and there are some things about getting the drawing more accurate that really it helps working from the photos for you guys and allows you to focus more on the color. And on the other hand, there are some lessons that you lose from that, but that's okay. We're just going to work through this this semester and get what we can. So here, um, it's really hard to see some of this type back here, and I understand that. But essentially, the colors that you guys are using are this cadmium red light, the alizarin crimson, which is down here, ultramarine blue, phthalo blue, cadmium yellow light, and the cadmium yellow medium. So now, our last paintings, you guys were on these inside wheels. Now you've moved all the way to the outside. You still have the access to these colors. You have them because you have them anyways, and I do allow you to use them, but I want you to use them more in the context of using these colors to desaturate what you're using out here and using them in mixtures with some of these colors that you mix out here. So the palette for our full color painting is, um, for our reds, we use the warm um, is cadmium red light. And if you have to buy this paint, you can use a permanent red um, that's a lot less expensive or a cadmium red light hue. Either one of those would be fine. Um, those would be cheaper versions. What I will tell you is both of those versions are transparent and actual cadmium red light is opaque. And so cadmium red light, it's really nice because you can mix it in with things and create that opacity and you don't have to do multiple layers to start building up a bright red. You can do it within one or two layers. Your cool is alizarin crimson, and this isn't an expensive pigment anyways. It is very transparent, but it's a really wonderful mixing um, kind of violet red. Um, it's really nice for mixing into your cool end of your spectrum. For your warms, you can use a Hansa yellow medium, which is very transparent, or um, you can look for a cadmium yellow medium hue which might be less expensive. It will be less expensive. Um, it might be less expensive than the Hansa yellow white is what I mean. Um, the cadmium yellow medium is really what we use in class and that one again has opacity. That's one of the nice things with the cadmium paints is they have opacity to them. Um, so cadmium yellow medium is what I recommend for this project, but you can use the cadmium yellow medium hue, which is a replacement or Hansa yellow medium. It's just the bulk be transparent. For your cool, what we use in class is cadmium yellow light. Um, the transparent versions that are less expensive of those are the Hansa yellow light or lemon or cadmium yellow light or lemon hue. Okay, And those would be your replacements that are less expensive if you need to buy it. For the blues, we're going to use the thalo blue, and thalo blue often comes in either a red shade or a green shade, and if you have the option, I would suggest the green shade as being the better choice because it's a little bit warmer. Not a lot, but it is a little bit warmer. Um, this is already not a terribly expensive pigment, so you don't need a replacement for it. Um, you also might see it called thalocyclamine or something like that. It's got a long chemical name. Don't let that throw you off. We just all call it thalo blue because it's a lot easier to say. For your cool, my recommendation is ultramarine blue deep. You might not be able to find ultramarine blue deep. If you have a problem with that, you can get regular ultramarine blue. Do not get French ultramarine. Okay, it needs to be just regular ultramarine blue or ultramarine blue deep, which is a little bit cooler in nature. The regular ultramarine blue is slightly less cool than the deep version, but they both work fine for this. Ultramarine blue is a semi-transparent pigment, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so again, that's this is the placement. The deep, the ultramarine blue deep is probably here. Ultramarine blue is probably a little bit more here. Thalo blue green shade, the cadmium yellow light, cadmium yellow medium, cadmium red light, and then the alizarin crimson. What you want to remember, I should say before I move out of this slide, is that these are going to mix a little bit better for making them dark when you stay within their color families, just like you learned. 
remember that if you move to the other side for their color fam of their color family and even though this might not feel far as far as physical distance as far as the crow flies if you really pay attention to it this is all the way on the other end of the color wheel from the yellow here and so it's going to make it very green toned okay and you want to keep that in mind it's going to make this yellow green toned it's also going to muddy it a little bit because this starts to move into the orange end of the spectrum okay so just keep this in mind as you darken things and remember that you might have other options that work better for mixing as we expand out to this outside it's nice because we have all these bright colors but it also makes what we call your color space this whole area in here a lot more complex and it gives you a lot more choices which is what makes it more complex and more difficult sometimes for you guys to understand what to do next um, so this is kind of what I was talking about with the alizarin crimson it's transparent and it, it's very transparent it's one of our glaze colors that we'll use sometimes and it's all the way over here in the cool end and so it actually mixes really nice with ivory black and with ultramarine blue um, because they're very cool as well and so that's something to kind of keep in mind as you darken this. We're going to want to lay in our backgrounds and so what I do on this painting is I have you guys lay in an underpainting just a thin tone that's done in um, the burnt umber this time not the raw umber but the burnt umber and you want to really thin it down and so if you remember previously what we did is we established our drawing got the drawing correct put it in with dark pencil um, if you have spray fixative you can spray fix it and that'll help a little bit or hairspray will help as well and then after you've done that what you're going to do is just do a very thin light tone of burnt umber with um, linseed oil okay and that's just to get rid of the white and then after you do that what we're going to do is we're going to mix some color and we're going to make what we'll use for our shadow mass and I'll show you some examples of this in a minute but one of the things that works really well on this is mixing burnt umber with the ultramarine blue why is that because look at their color families this is the orange color family over here burnt umbers in the orange family ultramarine blue is in the blue family if you've done much with color studies then you know that blue and orange are complements of each other so when you mix them together and these are two dark valued colors as well when you mix them together they neutralize so what happens is when we mix a little bit of burnt umber with a little bit of this ultramarine blue what we get is kind of a very thin transparent black and that's what it looks like within the paintings finally and if we thin that out a little bit then we get a nice rich kind of dark mass that we can use that feels close to black but it's not um, it doesn't have the black pigment in it it has color pigment in it that's making it feel like black and it mixes together to make this dark mass when we shadow mass what we want to do first is determine what's in the shadow mass okay if it's not being hit directly by the light source it's in the shadow mass and that includes things like reflected light this is in the shadow mass it's not being hit directly by a light source this is one of the big mistakes a lot of beginners make is they see things like a really bright reflected light and they think of it as more light and I want you to stop thinking about it like that and that aspect and think of it more as not being hit directly by the light source so it needs to stay in the shadow mass we want to take into account what the light composition is okay and that's one of the things that shadow massing allows us to do is to control our composition and decide not just how our composition happens as far as the objects that are within the painting but also how we define our composition using the light itself we can use shadow massing to build depth and atmosphere as we make decisions about that light composition and we use shadow massing to enhance the volume of complex objects so when we take something like a bunch of grapes if we think of them as lots of little individual shapes we're going to lose a sense of the volume of that overall object of the bunch of grapes very quickly on the other hand if we use shadow massing to block in where the light and shadow are being defined overall within that complex object of the bunch of grapes then we can kind of enhance the overall volume of it as well as the individual volumes of each grape 
These are just some examples I pulled off of the internet. This is from James Gurney's stuff where he shows how he blocked in the shadow mask for a portrait. And one of the things that's really nice about this is when you look at this first shadow mask that he blocked in, it's very clear where the light is hitting, what your light composition is going to be. You can see that as you continue developing this, you might lose some of that clarity of the light composition, but initially this helps you build the simplicity of the volume and helps you really keep in mind the three-dimensional shapes that you're trying to define within there and what that composition of light is that's hitting the form. Okay, this next slide is from David LaFell from a workshop that I attended and I took the photo. Um, it's a great example of kind of using first off a toned canvas. He pre-tones these so this was dry when he was working on it. Um, so a pre-toned canvas and then he came in with an umber, raw umber basically, and a little touch of black sometimes in that raw umber. And he blocked in a simple drawing and he uses the shadow mask to help establish his drawing here and get the volumes correct. So this the shadow mask, I, I know sometimes people kind of like think all these steps get ridiculous or whatever, but the sh masking in your shadows has kind of a multitude of functions. One of the things that it does besides helping to establish volume and so on in the painting is it also becomes an abstract way of allowing you to see the shadows and lights in your paintings that help you establish proper proportion. Um, within your complex objects or between objects within the painting because it allows you to kind of focus on them more as abstract or negative shapes in a way rather than just focusing on trying to draw contour lines. So um, that's a really nice aspect of it. Um, the shadow mass also becomes a way of kind of solidifying what we're doing within the object. Um, and so in this case, the shadow mask was used to also hit some of the color temperatures within here. You can see the difference in the shadow mask here versus here. And this is obviously a painting that's got a little bit more work happened on it, but um, that's kind of what's happening with that. And then this is a completed painting. I think this is a David LaFell painting. And this is a little bit of what I'm talking about as far as using the light to create a sense of focus in the painting. So um, you can imagine that if light was casting through this painting that is probably equally hitting a little bit more some of these areas and brightening them. What he's done is he's really controlled that focus of light so that it's primarily the hip, secondarily the inside of the thigh, and then we've got a little bit of it up in here. But he's that light is cast just a little bit lower so that we create the sense of focus within this area which directs our eye naturally to this bright area within the painting. Um, these are a little bit pixelated because they were taken from a little bit far away, but this is basically one of the images that a student was doing in class. And so this is the burnt umber tone that I was talking about. And then this is the dark that they mixed out of the raw umber and I mean, sorry, the burnt umber and the ultramarine mixed together. This was the fairy tale pumpkin. Um, you'll see some more images of this painting in just a minute and then you'll kind of see which one it probably was. And so what they've done is they've taken anywhere that they felt like was being hit by shadows um, and they've blocked that in with that shadow mass. And then what some of our artists have done is they've also decided what they want to do with their background. If they want to drop it into shadows and get rid of like drapery or whatever was back here, they might have hit this whole thing back here with the shadow mass. So this is kind of how we use the shadow mass to help us determine what we want to do compositionally within the painting. Here's another image, and this is kind of showing the next step. So here you can see they've blocked in very simply a lot of the shadow mass of um, a bunch of objects that were all piled up. I think some grapes and then a bunch of oranges and so on. And then here you can see that they're going in and starting to define what they're doing very simply with the color. This might remind you of some in some ways, but with a little bit more complexity of what we did on the limited palette painting, painting number two and three, where I showed massing in the basic areas of color first before we go through and try and resolve things. It's one of the things that I really liked about this image is it shows some of that process. Here's one that's a little bit further along. And so this one is kind of very akin to what we were doing um, when I did the demo on the master painting. So you can see, but more complexity of color because there is more complexity of color in a lot of these objects. But you can see how the shadow mass is kept within the dark shadow and they've actually started hitting some of the tones for the red drapery and so on in here, but kept it very simple. They've blocked this all in as being part of their shadow mass and they're gonna keep it dark. 
you can see that um, they've started blocking in some of the simple ranges of color that are going to happen, like the lighter, um, brighter areas versus the warmer, deeper areas, and then the deepest, cool green areas. Same thing happening with these limes and this mango right here. So this is a really great kind of like beginning block in of just showing how all that color interacts. I really want you guys, like once you get through this first stage right here of getting the shadow light, this is how I want you to work the color. I want you to block it in very simply. And one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the colors that you guys might end up using on this painting are going to be transparent pigments. And so it actually does you no good at all to paint through and try and finish these objects when you paint through and work on them the first time because you're going to have to work on them a second time to start building up opacity to the color. And if you paint it in more thinly in the beginning like this, the paint's going to dry a lot more quickly for you. So it just logically makes a lot more sense to kind of block things in simply but get correct color and value representations and then come back through and start refining. This is one that's still in beginning stages. You can see a lot of this very roughly blocked in and that and then some areas that feel like they've got a little bit more tension but still very simple and um, they're working that painting as a whole so it's all um, coming up together as a whole as well. Notice they've done a nice job of maintaining their shadows versus their lights. Um, on all of their objects within here. So that looks really solid right now. This background and the actual photograph that they were working from for this had a ton of crap in it. And they've gotten rid of all of that and decided to create the focus within this area here. And you can just see that in the way that they're treating like the contrast levels and so on. Here's one that's getting part of the way done. And so you can see there are some areas that have a lot more resolution. Others, they've just started blocking in some color. This one, they're working a little differently. I kind of prefer more when you work through the whole painting like this, but there are some nice things with this. So notice that, yeah, a lot of the shadow and light here is more resolved. Do they have more work to do? Oh, definitely. There's more work to do. Okay, um, so same thing here with that pumpkin. So this is one of the fairy tale pumpkins I was talking about. Um, that that other composition was built on. But these are some great examples of how to work through these underpaintings in a very simple way and get things blocked in and get all your representation so that you start seeing like the relationships between this area and this area or these individual grapes. This one's got a little bit more orange. This one's got a little bit more of a violety pink and so on. These have more gray in them and so on. And you want to see how these colors are all interacting. And this is really nice for helping to create a sense of unity with these desaturated colors. And then you can build up more saturation as you keep going. And this one is really nice as well. So the composition of light. A lot of times we're used to thinking of composition as in our objects within the painting and how those objects are set up in relationship to each other. But the way that we use composition as far as our light source can become really a, way, a great way of leading the eye through the painting as well. So some of the things we want to think about is which direction is the light coming from and how strong is it? Okay, and how strong also relates to what is the focal point because you're going to find that the light will be stronger in some places like that one of the female nude where it was really strong on the hip of the lady but in other places like up on her upper shoulder it was not so strong so the focal point was that hip area, the hip and thigh. How deep are the shadows? If we deepen the shadows behind a bright area it's going to make that bright area stand out even more. As we look at some of these Baroque paintings, we can look at some of um, these things that we were just talking about. How deep are the shadows back here behind this white object? How bright is this light? What's the focal point in this? There's light over on these areas as well, but I would say probably the focal point is this white vase. And it's really nice how this brightness here kind of leads you back up. So if you lead in from here the direction of the light hit this bright focal point. It's um, isolated by these shadows behind it. This might have had more light within it, but by darkening this, it helps create that isolation. Brings us up through here. We see the richness and these round shapes here kind of help circle us back around again. Here we can see that in the shadow areas, we don't see almost any detail at all. Um, a lot of times people focus so much attention to building up everything that's happening in the shadow area equally to the light area. What the Baroque artists tell us, 
by the way that they've treated their paintings is that the shadow areas are secondary and that the light areas are really where our eyes focus. And logically, that just makes sense. When we have things that have a bright light on them, we tend to look at that first and look at the shadow areas secondarily, if at all. So if we create less of a sense of contrast, less of a sense of detail in the shadow areas, we also help create a sense of we want people to focus in the light. We control where they focus. You can see here the shadows are not so deep. There is some resolution within the shadow areas. Some of the reflected lights are really nice, but the contrast here shows us where the light side of the form actually is. The way that different artists have controlled this so it varies quite a lot. So here we've got one where we've got these soft shadows. The shadows tend to be somewhat washed out. Um, we see a lot more attention to the light, light and detail and the patterns, and the shadows help create some of those details that we're looking at. Oh, and the black background, this kind of reminds me of that one still life one of the students had done, just took away the background completely as being part of the equation. Here the shadows are deep, but they're not so deep that we don't get some reflected lights. We can see though that there's kind of a lowering of kind of the sense of resolution of what's happening in here. As it goes behind the glass, we see it get lost completely. This almost looks more like underpainting, and that was a really common thing within the Baroque artists, was to block in their underpainting, um, kind of like those color ones that the students did that I showed you a little bit ago, and then only do minimal um, development of those shadow sides and do most of the resolution with opacity within the light side. There's another one. Um, here you can see the shadows are really, they've got some color richness to them at the turning areas, but mostly the shadows are kind of dark. We don't have a lot of detail within them. Here we see the detail is within the light side, not within the shadows. It's a beautiful Rembrandt that's hanging at the Rijks Museum, one of my favorite paintings actually. Um, and you can see here these dark clouds are actually just underpainting. Um, you can see that the development of all the detail is right here. So Rembrandt knows how to focus us. Additional areas of detail, he's lowered the contrast level down a lot. He's done a lot less resolution. If you look at the detail within these areas versus here where you almost feel like you could see every single leaf, you can see kind of what I'm talking about. Here's a close-up. Um, I didn't get a lot of close-ups of this painting. I was more focused on the underpainting, and I wish I'd gotten some close-ups of this. But here in this close-up, you can see what I mean about every little leaf and branch being paid attention to down here, and the richness of kind of the color temperature shifts and so on that happen. Whereas here in those dark clouds, it's underpainting. This is the canvas texture in the background. There's a little bit more depth, sometimes darkness in here. They've used some glazing techniques of bringing in the semi-opaque whites on top. Makes it feel smoky and it really allows this feeling of like finality of the painting versus the early progressions of the painting to create a beautiful um, kind of interaction between the areas of shadow and the areas of light. So Baroque lighting, some of the hallmarks of Baroque lighting are dynamic composition such as in the Rembrandt we just looked at dramatic light elements like in the Rembrandt we just looked at. That one so much not rich deep color but we do see a lot of rich deep color used to help develop a sense of Baroque lighting and atmosphere and depth. Let's just remember that in the Baroque period um, if you've done your art history and things like that what you've learned is that for the Baroque artists it was almost like too much was not enough so it was more of everything more shadows more lights more emotion, more drapery, more paint expressiveness. All of these things were really hallmarks of that Baroque period. It's not that every single painting has all of those characteristics, but the, the paintings that we think of as typ typical for that Baroque period have at least some of those characteristics. We can look at this one right here, which was another painting by Rembrandt, and you can see kind of what I mean. Like, look at the rich color that's in this is in these two foreground, ele foreground elements, and it creates very much a sense of the composition. We can see the background elements are very desaturated, very low contrast, very little definition within them. They're kind of blocked in just enough to reference what they are and to make you feel like there is a background, but he didn't waste a lot of time on this. This is the kind of background that could have been blocked in within a day or two. He spent 
lots of time though on these foreground elements. <coughs> okay, you can see the light and so on that was brought in here. And as we look more closely, a real richness to like the light and shadow that was brought within this area. Here's a portrait, one of his older portraits. So there's a definite difference between port, um, his painting style when he was young and his painting style when he was old. And there's been a lot of discussion on why that is. A lot of people feel that um, he had sight issues, vision issues, and that was part of the reason that the paint technique got rougher. But <coughs> I tend to feel that there was also probably, as he grew older, a real love for the paint technique itself, for the beauty of the oil paint. And as he got older, he cared a little bit less about pleasing others with making a very refined, smooth technique, which is what his early paintings were, and became more and more enamored with the actual technique of painting itself. And you can see how beautiful it is, um, the richness of color. And if you notice the shadows, there is not a richness of color in any of the shadow areas. Even within the face, the shadow becomes very toned down, very desaturated. Look at like the resolution of depth within the eye here versus this eye. Um, this eye is still a little bit in shadow, but it's got a little bit more uh, definition within the eyelid, definition within the color of the eye and so on here. It's almost just dark. He's barely blocked it in so that you focus. And I would say... I think most would agree that this is where he wants us to look. It's right here. And this is the area that your eye is drawn to. And it's drawn to it for many reasons. Partly that contrast, partly the brighter light, the richer color, the really rich paint technique that pulls you into the folds of skin and makes the flesh feel almost like it's a living thing. I'll skip through that. This one again, the richness of color happens within here with where he wants us to focus is another Rembrandt painting. Not so much rich color back here, much lower contrast, um, much brighter contrast, more light and shadow within these areas. This is a Caravaggio painting. So again, Caravaggio, we talked about him towards the beginning of the semester, but very cinematic with the way that he did his chiaroscuro, um, light and shadow. So you can see that the shadows, the depth, the backgrounds are not paid very much attention to in many of his paintings. They're dark, and he chooses to create instead just on the cinematic kind of staging of the characters within his painting. So here we've got um, David and Goliath. Um, this right here, um, the crucifixion of St. Peter. So you can see how we see all of these elements here. We don't even know what's going on in the background at all. They've created this focus within these foreground elements with the way they've used the light. And again, with this Caravaggio painting, The Calling of St. Matthew, everybody pointing to this poor guy at the end. Um, so you can see the diagonal light. So this is basically light composition used in very obvious ways to help create a sense of focus within the painting and the composition of light that really focuses within the center of this painting here. Um, this one, um, I believe this was a Rubens. I'd have to look back, but I believe this was a Rubens. And again, just the composition of light in here, much stronger light within here and within these little areas. The background, almost not developed at all. Even this leg going back in the background, you're like, if you equally develop this, then it draws our eye up in this corner. By not developing this area and letting it fall into the shadows more, it keeps us within this action of these two figures. Um, here's a Rubens right here. Um, so again, the focus of light within this area, not focusing back here, you know, giving us some idea of what the setting is, but definitely much lower in key. Um, and we focus within those areas. So let's just look through some of these class examples. And some other things I'd like you to pay attention to are like the difference in color from shadow areas to light areas. That the shadow is not, if you think of the object as being a yellow banana and you're going to dip it in one color of yellow and then make that yellow darker and lighter, you're going to run into issues. So what you want to pay more attention to is separating out your shadows and lights. And sometimes that's done with different colors. Sometimes you use cool reds and then warm reds. 
or you use blues and then you use greens and yellows okay so um, remember to kind of separate out um, your shadow side from your light side in ways that also pay attention to how you're going to treat the color when you do that this is a great example of like the cool violets very blue gray violets used on the cool side of the eggplant versus the warm side of the eggplant which is a very kind of warm um, red violet and here the light on this pumpkin is handled so beautifully going across where they've got warmer yellows they didn't just add black to the yellow black to the yellow would have made this more like um, green okay so what they did is they used yellows and then they used oranges and then you used deep kind of burnt oranges and maybe even a little bit of violets or greens you'll notice in some of them some of the other images that the shadows shift where they might have added like either greens or violets into their shadow tones to get to those tones this one is a really nice treating of this fairy tale pumpkin it's a little bit oranger and you'll see what I mean when you look at the photos the photos are not this orange for this fairy tale pumpkin but what I love is the way they really desaturated here in the background the other thing that they did to help create a sense of the pumpkin going back into the dark background is they soften this edge and they lowered the contrast down so it allows this area to really come forward and this area to really disappear into the background better uh, this was a nice kind of initial block in um, and I can't remember if they developed it further than this but I thought this was so beautifully blocked in here as far as like really paying attention to the richness of the shadows versus the light sides and the differing colors so this is a perfect example of why I tell you guys please do not paint the object one color and then make it lighter and darker and this is another great example here using kind of these purpley reds and then the warm reds for the light sides and you can see how just the temperature shifts help create a sense of the light versus the shadow So there are different things in all of these that I think are strong or not strong, but pay attention to like the way people are using color, the way they're separating out their shadows and lights from each other. Um, notice here that this light side, we this is the tendency we have is to think of like the pumpkin as being orange, even though it's a fairy tale pumpkin and it's really kind of a peachy beige, or the grapes being purple and yet really they're more of a gray or a gray blue okay the apple being red and yet really the apple has like some varieties of red happening to it that are much different than what you're thinking of so what I want you to do is really pay attention to what you are actually seeing and not what you think something is this is a great example of a complex volume that's been simplified down using shadows and then just hitting lights and little bits of areas to bring out these areas that need to pop forward um, really rich example of the shadow, the difference in color in the shadow side versus the light side. Um, this one and this one are the same photo, just different treatments. So in some ways I prefer this. I love the way that they've created a sense of focus. They've darkened a lot of this out and that's totally acceptable if you want to do some of that. They've created a richness of color within some of these areas in a really beautiful sense of the way the light's casting through here and notice how dark they've left some of these grape areas but notice how bright these colors are they had a lot of fun kind of playing with some thin painting techniques and stuff in here so I'm not knocking it but this is probably closer to the actual colors you can see the grays and so on in here really nicely handled the abstractness of the way they handled the shadow and lights in here on the other hand this is a piece of drapery that was kind of popping out of the shadows and this pumpkin they do nothing to add to this if anything they kind of distract so at the very least I would have said probably darken all this area and get rid of all of this and that's kind of what I want you guys to think of with these photos and if you're familiar with something like Photoshop you can even download the photo on your desktop and play around with it and play around with like darkening areas of it I want you to keep enough objects in there that you have things to play with and you have things to do as far as like color and light and shadow I don't want you to simplify it down to just the bunch of grapes okay but you can simplify it down to what feels like a good composition for you and remember that's what it should be it should feel like a good composition not that you did it to get rid of the bottle that was in front of everything if something's right in front you need to keep that in probably 
Um, this one's from the still life again. We looked at this one earlier, but I kind of wanted to reiterate it again after the Baroque lighting part of this lecture so that you saw what I meant about creating a sense of focus within these objects now. This one, they did a really nice job of darkening this and darkening some of these and just referring to them enough so that they felt like they were there, but not so descriptive that they went into an explanation. So that was kind of nicely handled. Um, this one as well, nicely handled. It really creates a sense of focus in these objects. Very much makes its nod to the Baroque masters. Really rich light and shadow and color within these oranges down here and within the pepper and so on. This one they chose to keep pretty much everything within there, but a beautiful sense of like their colors within the shadow side and keeping a richness in there. Um, this one, they didn't get rid of a lot within this, um, but they wanted to keep the complete thing, but a lot of nice things within this painting as well. These were from Still Lives again. So just a lot of different ways of treating some of these. Hopefully this gives you kind of a good idea of like what you might want to do. You can remember the other one that I said that they darkened the contrast, but they kept some of the objects in. In this one, that was the area they chose to get rid of. So they lowered that completely into depth. Um, one thing you'll want to do if you're going to darken a background is don't just paint it with flat black. Okay, do it in multiple layers of slowly building up a transparent dark that it feels really transparent, kind of like those underpaintings I showed you earlier and then another layer on top and then another layer on top and you'll get a much better dark back there that feels like it has depth to it because you've built it up in layers. If you do it in just one layer of flat black, it's going to feel very flat like we can touch it. This is one of the pumpkin ones. Nice reference to some of the color and so on in this and darkening and kind of like softening and letting things fall back in that darkness really nice rich color in some of these areas and you see the difference between like a red onion and a red bell pepper and why you need two completely different reds that you can kind of mix between to get both. 